Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank Father for allowing me to speak in this very large church and the other priests who are here on celebrating Mass and to hear confessions. But I'd especially like to thank all of you for being here because I know there's many other things you could be doing and I appreciate that you're here tonight with the Lord and with me. I wonder, have any of you heard me speak before? Could you raise your hands? Oh, a few of you. For those who've not been before and maybe come for healing, please understand the healing begins in the Holy Mass. The Holy Eucharist is the greatest healing prayer of all. Where the greatest physician, God himself, fills you with himself, his healing love. The healing continues through the talk because very often people say, as I spoke, by the grace of God, they were healed. Then afterwards, when the blessed sacrament will be exposed, and I'll lay hands on people and pray with them. And at that time, we're very blessed to have seven priests here in confession. And after the Eucharist, confession is the next most powerful healing prayer, healing sacrament. And if you want the best healing, it's important you have a good confession. So the healing tonight is sacramental. It's in the Eucharist, with the Blessed Sacrament exposed. It's in the Sacrament of Confession, and through the powerful sacrament of the priesthood. And my talk and my prayers only complement the sacraments. Now I'm going to speak for about three hours. <laughs> Had you worried, didn't I? <laughs> It'll be, be about 30 minutes or so. I hope you'll be patient with me. And I hope you can understand my accent. I lived a very bad life. I didn't believe in God. I only believed in myself and what I could get for myself. I sought all the pleasures, all the excitement that the world can give. And I got many of them. I was addicted to many things. Alcohol was the least of my addictions. When I was young in London, where I grew up, with my older brother, I joined the worst motorcycle gang there is, and I became extremely violent. And all I ever thought about was myself, getting what I wanted. And I didn't care what I had to do. I'd lie, I'd steal, I'd cheat, I'd do anything. I didn't care about others, I abused them, I hurt them. People meant nothing to me. All I thought about was myself. And even though I was a baptised Catholic, I never really believed in God. And the only time I thought about God was when I was in trouble, I might say, God help me. Or at times, I'd have the occasional thought that if God did exist, he couldn't love someone like me, how could he? I've been so bad. Surely if God existed, he condemned someone like me to hell, not love me. But 22 years ago, at the age of 40, when I was in the darkest part of my life, doing the most disgusting sins, the most terrible things, and certainly not looking for God, not even thinking about him, God was obviously thinking about me. Because he reached through the darkness I was living in to touch me with the light of his love. And it was incredible. In one moment, he reached so deep inside of me and caressed my soul with his love. It was amazing. Instantly I was filled with ecstasy, with joy, with happiness beyond this world that no drugs, no alcohol could give you. And as Jesus embraced my soul and lifted my human heart into his divine heart and filled it with his love and surrounded it with his love, it, it was so wonderful, it was beyond this world that all my addictions fell away just in one second just to be replaced with a desire to love God. Because I didn't want to lose this feeling ever again, because it's the most wonderful thing. And Jesus said to me, I love you. And in those three words I knew was a divine truth, an eternal truth, that God loved me. He always loved me. It was just that I'd stopped loving him. 
He never stopped loving me. Regardless of the bad things I've done, all the terrible things I've done, my faults, my weaknesses, still he loved me. And in those three words, I love you, I saw he loved everyone else exactly the same as he loved me. There's no difference in his love for us. The only difference is how much we love him. And as Jesus lifted me beyond this world and heavenwards and filled me with that divine love, it was so incredible. And you know, I look back at times and think, you know, if someone else had told me what had happened to me, I probably wouldn't believe them. But having experienced it, I believe it. But also I wonder why did it happen? There I was lost in darkness and in sin and God came into my life in such a powerful way. And later I, he showed me that it was all the people around the world who were praying. So often they're praying and they think their prayers aren't answered and they wonder should they carry on praying and prayer such a struggle and they come to mass often and in prayer groups or pray at home. And sometimes they see no results or they, they think there's no results. But there are. Because it's because of your prayers, people like you, that God reached into my life and touched me. And I meet many people around the world who say they were living a, a life of sin. And then all of a sudden, one day, God came into their life. They don't know how because they weren't looking for him. Well, the answer is it's all those people who are praying, who persevere in their prayers, persevere in their loving of God. Through them, that grace is poured out to touch people around the world. So I thank you all for that and I encourage you, never stop praying. You know, as Jesus filled me with his love, I fell in love with him. I never wanted to lose that love again. Now every day is a journey trying to get closer to him and to experience his love more and more in each day. I want to abandon myself totally in Christ, lose myself in him, because I know in doing so, I'll truly find myself. Today, many people maybe have forgotten how much God loves us. They see God sometimes as distant, as far away, as judgmental, as condemning. Some people fear God, but there's nothing to fear in God. He's tender, he's kind, he's merciful, he's loving, he's forgiving. The only fear I have in life now is that I might stop loving God. I never want that to happen. But God's not distant, he's not far away. Jesus is beside us every moment of our life. In every moment he's reaching out to us in love. He's crying out, I love you. He has a passionate love for each person. He aches with love for each one of us. To him, every person, no matter who they are, is a treasure, is a jewel, is precious. Jesus is actually in love with every one of us. And just like when you're in love with someone, you want them to have a good and a happy life and you'll do all you can to help them to be happy. In the same way, Jesus, who's in love with us, he wants us to have a good and a happy life. And he offers us all that's good, all the grace, all the gifts, all the love we need so we can have that life. In every moment, Jesus is crying out to every person, I love you. Love me. And he aches, he hungers, he thirsts, he longs for our love. Not because that will make him any greater, that's impossible. God is great in himself. But because it will make you greater. Because when you love God as you should, putting the Father, Son and Holy Spirit before all others, before all else, before even yourself, you push the world and self aside. And your heart and soul are completely open to God as they should be. And now... With that open heart, open soul, you're inviting Jesus within. And he waits for that invitation. And then he'll reach into you and fill you with grace, with gifts, with love, in abundance. And he'll elevate you, he'll lift you heavenward, he'll sanctify you, he'll make you holy in him. Because that's what he wants to do. He wants every one of you to be holy people, to be the saints of today. In every moment, Jesus is crying out, I love you. Love me. And yet today so many people refuse to love Jesus, even those who come to Mass, even those who pray in prayer groups. They won't love Jesus completely as they should because they put the world and self before God. And when you do that, you place barriers on your heart and soul between you and God. 
So you can't experience Jesus in every day, in every moment, as you're meant to. You're meant to live in him in every second, for him, through him, and with him. But if you put the world and self first, that's impossible. Because when you focus on self, you close your heart to God, you turn away from him. In every moment, Jesus is crying out, I love you, love me. And he cries out, why won't you love me? Why do you turn away from me? What have I done to hurt you? What have I done to offend you? I love you so much, I gave my life for you. I carried all of your pain, all of your hurts, all of your suffering on the cross with me. I suffered and died for you individually because I love every one of you. And in my resurrection, I opened the doors of heaven to everyone so that you can all have eternal joy, eternal peace and happiness with the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And he wonders why that's not enough. That offer is the greatest offer you can get. But for many people, they see that as a small offer and they look for the things of the world, try to have heaven on earth, chase the things of the world instead of chasing the things of heaven. And look at the world. I mean, it's gone completely mad. I mean, it really has. And you want the things of the world? How foolish are we? We're like a ship of fools. We're just lost, chasing after these things that are of little value. When what's of true value is there with us in every second, but we tend to ignore it, close our hearts, our souls, our lives to the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. In every moment, Jesus is there crying out, I love you. Love me. Let me love you. Let me embrace you with my love. Because that's the best thing you can do in your life. And that's what Jesus wants for you. The best. Now he knows it's a struggle. He knows it's not easy to live your faith. Because there are many temptations, many distractions in the world. And we're all full of, all of us, every one of us. Is full of, we've got failings, we've got weaknesses. We can be so easily distracted, drawn away from Jesus. He knows it's difficult for you. But he doesn't expect you to do it by yourself. Jesus sent you a helper. You know, the apostles who walked with Jesus, they saw him, they touched him, they heard his holy word, they saw the miracles, they felt the power of his love. And yet one betrayed him. In his passion, others denied him and abandoned him. It was only after his death and resurrection then at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit that they knew the fullness of God in Jesus Christ and they found the grace, the strength, the passion, the love to live and die for him and they gave us the church we have today by his grace. And if it was like that for the apostles who were with Jesus then it's like that for us. We've got our faults, we've got our weaknesses. We betray Jesus just like Judas did. Every time we sin, every time we sin and come to Mass, we're betraying Jesus, we're denying him. We're still coming to him just as Jesus was with him, um, Judas was with him, but Judas betrayed him. We betray him. We have our weaknesses, our failures. We can't live our faith in the way we should. So it's important that we ask the Holy Spirit, who Jesus has sent us as a helper, every day to help us. And we'll get the same grace, the same gifts, the same power and passion of love for God and for others that the apostles got from the Holy Spirit if we ask for it, if we truly want it, and open our hearts and souls and truly live in it. We need to make every day our Pentecost. Not just once a year when we come to church, but every day should be our Pentecost. My first prayer every morning is to the Holy Spirit. Asking the Holy Spirit to help me offer every thought I have, every word I speak, every action I do, every breath I take, every heartbeat. To offer that to God as a prayer of love. And by his grace, that's what it becomes. Now, I still struggle at times with it. I still fall down. It's still not easy. There's many heavy crosses. But now what happens is, when I fall down, the Holy Spirit is there. He picks me up. When I'm distracted and my focus isn't on God and on heaven, the Holy Spirit brings it back onto God, onto heaven. And when the crosses are so heavy, he helps me understand and feel the strength of Jesus lifting the crosses with me and giving me the grace, the strength to carry these crosses. In every moment, there is the Holy Spirit, the helper that Jesus sent, the Father sent, the 
Holy Spirit who came willingly to share his grace, his love, his power, his passion with every one of you. But he just wants you to ask for it, to accept it, and to live in it and for it and with it. And then you'll find that your faith will still be a struggle. It's still not easy. It wasn't easy for Jesus. It won't be easy for us, but we'll find that we can persevere, that we can endure. We'll have the strength to carry on loving God no matter what happens to us in our lives. You know, recently, I was just hearing uh, last week, I think it was, in, uh, in Syria where such terrible things are happening. Two young boys, Catholics, the, uh, the Islamists got hold of them and they said to them, convert to Islam or we'll crucify you. These boys were 10 years old and 12 years old. They refused and they were crucified. Now I wonder, would I have that strength for these young boys? And I wonder, would any of us here today have that strength? They had that strength because they loved God, they loved Jesus, and they were completely open to the Holy Spirit who gave them that strength to imitate Jesus in his death and to be resurrected then in him in heaven for etern in eternal glory. And if we turn to the Holy Spirit, we can have that strength that a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old boy had. We just have to want it. We have to seek it. You know, there's a, a time when I was really struggling. And I thought I couldn't carry on. The crosses were so heavy, I thought they'd break me. And uh, it was really difficult. Well, our blessed mother Mary came to me. And she came to lead me closer to Jesus and find my strength in him. She said, uh, you have, you know, come to the Holy Mass because it's here you'll find Jesus, you'll find God, and you'll find his strength. And uh, she always leads me closer and closer to Jesus. That's all she wants to do for everyone, is draw us closer to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not closer to herself. She's so humble, she wants us to be closer to God. And I'd like to share this message from Jesus about his blessed mother in one of my books called Stories of Love. My mother one day took my hand in hers and walked with me to the markets. On the way we saw a man on the side of the road who was crippled and bent in pain. My dear mother went and spoke to him to try and comfort him. He was in so much pain it was difficult for him to answer but he begged for help. My mother wiped his brow and held him in her arms and rocked him gently as he cried in pain. Mother looked at me with such sorrow in her eyes it seemed her heart would break. In her eyes I could see her asking me to help. How could I refuse my mother whom I loved so much? I came to the man and placed my hand on his head. His pain was lifted and he stood up and danced for joy. Praising God, he turned to mother and kissed her gently on the cheek and thanked her for her help. Mother said, Thank my son, for it was he, not I, who healed you. The man came up and embraced me and shouted his thanks to God. In this action, my mother showed that she will help lead those in need, in pain, in suffering, those who are lost, lead them to the love of God. Mother showed in her humility that it is God who does all. But she also showed that I cannot refuse my mother's request for help because I love her so much. Mankind should remember this and ask my mother to help. Anyway, she direct, directed me to the Holy Mass to find my strength there. And she said, when you come to the Mass, you must come in love because it's the sacrament of love, the sacrament of sacraments, and it's filled with the God of love. And she said, come to the Holy Mass imitating Jesus. Jesus, who in every Holy Mass is waiting patiently for you to come to him. He knows everyone who's coming to Mass. He wishes it would be more. I remember a few weeks ago I was in Perth, Australia, on a, a Saturday vigil Mass. And there's only a, a few people in the church. And Jesus, the statue came alive. He looks around and he said, where are my people? Jesus knows everyone who's coming to Mass. And he's, he's longing, he's aching for your presence and your love. And in the same way, every day we should be anticipating receiving Jesus in the Holy Mass. 
We should be longing, aching, hungering and thirsting for his presence and his love. So that when we come to the Mass, we're truly looking for God and not trapped in self, not trapped in the world, not prisoners in the pure. Jesus, in every holy Mass, he empties himself into us and for us. And when we come to the Holy Mass, we're meant to come as, as empty vessels, pushing the world and self aside. Vessels waiting to be filled with Jesus, so we can be filled with his divine presence, his divine love, and become tabernacles of love. Jesus, in every Holy Mass, is reaching out to us, saying, I love you. And for there to be a true union of love, you have to respond. It can't be just Jesus reaching out to you in love, and you ignoring him. You have to respond to him in love, so that you meet in love, you unite in love, you become one in love. And when you do that, then Jesus draws your humanity into his divinity. In the Holy Mass, God and man become one. Heaven and earth unite. And Jesus will raise you heavenwards and glorify you in his divine being. But you have to want that and seek that in every Holy Mass by first asking the Holy Spirit when you come to the Mass to help you celebrate it in the way you should, to be completely open to Jesus as you should, and to be able to give yourself completely to him. In every Holy Mass, Jesus gives himself to us all of himself. He holds nothing back. His body, his blood, his soul, his divinity, all he is. If there was any more to give to you, he would give it, but there's no more. He empties himself completely. And in the same way, we're meant to give all of ourselves to Jesus, our mind, our body, our soul, our humanity. So truly, we can be one in him in the Holy Eucharist, in the Holy Mass. And when we do that, Jesus will take hold of us ever so gently and he'll place us on the altar with him. And this is where we're supposed to be. We're meant to be on the altar with Jesus as a sacrificial offering of love to the Father in heaven, in Jesus, with Jesus and through Jesus. And when we let Jesus place us on the altar, some, some wonderful things happen. And Jesus will lead you beyond the physical to see the spiritual and the mystical if you persevere in doing this. And the Mass will open up and you'll, over time, discover so much that you'd never seen before. When Jesus places you on the altar with him, and as the priest says those words over the bread and wine, the priest who, before that, when he says, wash away my iniquities and cleanse me from my sins. From that moment on, in the Holy Mass, the priest is pure. He's, there's a sanctifying grace in the Holy Mass that makes the priest pure. So he can be pure to make the pure and perfect sacrifice. God purifies the priest and fills him with grace in a way no other person can be filled with grace. I remember once looking at the altar, seeing the priest shining completely white. He was filled completely with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit showed me the priest was lifted to levels of grace that is beyond anyone else can achieve. And he's filled with grace to overflowing that pours out through the priest to touch the people. As that grace is magnified through him to touch them, to bring them closer to God, to bring their focus on God in heaven. And when you look by the grace of God, sometimes maybe you'll see the priest as that pure vessel that he is. So that the pure offering can be made. And then when the priest, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, says those words over the bread and wine, to sanctify them, to make them holy. If you cry out to the Holy Spirit at that moment, sanctify me, Lord, make me holy, then the Holy Spirit will pour out that grace, but you have to want it. You have to truly long for it. And when the priest, by the Holy, grace of the Holy Spirit, changes the bread and wine into the body, blood, soul and divinity of our Lord, our God, our Saviour, if you cry out to the Holy Spirit, change me, then the Holy Spirit will change you to be more and more like Jesus. And that's what the Holy Mass is meant to be, an experience of change where you become more and more like Jesus. And if you let Jesus place you on the altar with him, you can start to experience so many wonderful things if you persevere. You know, Jesus will place you in the chalice He'll cover you with his precious blood. And you know, the first time I experienced that, it was wonderful. Such peace, such joy, such happiness, and such security. All my fears, they just disappeared as that precious blood washed around me, and it's like a blanket of love surrounding me. And when Jesus places you in the chalice as you give yourself to him, you can put all your crosses, 
all your struggles, all your cares, all your sicknesses, your weaknesses, all the family members you're having problems with, everyone you know who's struggling in life, you can place them in the chalice with you. So as that chalice is raised heavenward to the Father as a sacrificial offering of love in the hands of the purified priest, then you and those you put in the chalice with you are raised heavenward to the Father. And you and them are blessed by the Father. And this is what you're meant to do. You're never meant to come to God by yourself. You're meant to bring others with you. You're meant to bring others to Jesus. And when you come to communion and you eat of, eat of his body and drink of his blood, then it's so different. You know, they say you are what you eat. Well, when you eat of Jesus, you become like Jesus if you want to be, if you seek that. And this is how you overcome the weaknesses of the flesh. And we all have them. Everyone has them. These temptations that are there. At times we get these bad thoughts coming in that we wonder where they come from and we think badly about other people. We're drawn to do bad things and we never seem to be able to overcome them. We, we want to stop and we say we're never going to do it again and all of a sudden we're doing it again. And we wonder why. But this is how we overcome the weaknesses of the flesh. Because when you eat of the flesh of Christ, your flesh and his flesh becomes one. He sanctifies your flesh. He makes your flesh holy. He gives you the strength to overcome those weaknesses. If you want it, if you seek it, if you hold on to it. And as you drink of his precious blood, as that blood flows through your veins and arteries, as it washes through your body, it sanctifies your body. It cleanses the neurons in your brain. It cleanses every cell in your being. And still, when you'll still get those bad thoughts coming into you because that's what the evil one does. He puts all these thoughts into your mind to try to, try to distract you. But what you'll find then is that God will be there reaching out to you trying to lead you away from those thoughts and you have to play your part you have to hold on to God as he's reaching out to you I mean when these temptations come to me I, I, I can understand what they are and I see Jesus there reaching out to me and I say over and over in my mind Jesus I love you and the temptations they just disappear and all of a sudden I'm focusing on God in heaven as I'm meant to be this is how I overcome the temptations in Christ this is how you can because he gives you the same grace as he gives me. He gives you the same love as he gives me. And all you have to do is accept that grace, accept that love, hold on to it. So when those bad thoughts come or when the temptations get hold of you, let the thoughts of Christ, let the thoughts of the Father and the Holy Spirit fill your mind, fill your body, so that you're drawn away from them. When you eat and drink of Jesus, he'll fill you completely. And he said in Holy Scripture, remain in me so I can remain in you. And what he's doing is calling us to frequent Eucharist, to receive him frequently so that we can remain in him as, and he can remain in us to give us the strength, the passion, the love that we need to live our faith, to live for God and not live for the world. We need to remain in him daily if possible. I can't survive without Jesus every day. He's my life. That's the power I have that drives me on to live. Without Jesus, I don't know what I'll do. I have to remain in him every day because remaining in him is so wonderful. Such joy, such peace, such happiness, even when the most difficult crosses are there. He fills you with this wonderful love as he fills you completely with his divine self. So that when you leave the church, when you've received Jesus in this way, no longer do you leave him behind, as most people do. Most people come to Mass, receive Jesus, then they go out of the church and then they just live like everyone else. Well, that's not how it's meant to be. God has called us to be different, different to everyone else, not the same as everyone else in the world, but to be the lights of his love in the world. And to be different, we need to remain in him so we can be changed daily or frequently to be more and more like him, so that when we're filled with him, we now have our living God alive inside of us so that when we leave the church in our life, we can take the living God to others so that he can reach out through us. Just as he reached out through Mary when he was inside Mary to touch Elizabeth and John the Baptist and fill them with the Holy Spirit. Now when we have Jesus alive inside of us, our Eucharistic Lord living inside of us as we embrace him in our love and he embraces us in his love, then he'll reach out through us to touch others, to bless them, to heal them, just as he did through Mary. 
But you have to want that. You have to seek that. Sadly, so many Catholics don't because, so many Christians don't because they're distracted by the world and thoughts of self. And today we all complain about how bad the world is and why aren't so many people come to church. We blame everyone else and we forget to look at ourselves. The reason is us because we're not living our faith. We're not sharing Jesus and his divine, tender, gentle, forgiving and merciful love with everyone as we're meant to. When you live in the Eucharist, you know you have to do this. And you take that living God, the God of love, Jesus Christ with the Father and the Holy Spirit to everyone you meet. And through you, God will change the world. People say, oh, I can't change the world, I'm one person. In yourself, you can't. But in Christ our Lord, you can change the world. You just have to trust and believe in him and let him work through you. Now with that, I'm going to share just two little things before we go on to the healing part. First one's called a Eucharistic Rosary. It's where the Lord gave me visions on the Eucharist for every decade of the Rosary. I'll only share five with you, there's 20 visions. He said, give it to the sick, there'll be many healings. Give it to those who don't pray, there'll be many conversions. Around the world, there's been many thousands. And uh, I'll share a couple with you in a minute. I had the visions painted up and put into a, a pamphlet, which is available in the hall tonight. Uh, it was 20 years ago. And when I was talking to the people who helped me and we're looking at the pamphlet, wondering what to do with it, our Blessed Mother Mary was there with rosaries falling out of her hands. And she said, give a, a rosary bead out with each pamphlet and she'll bless it. But it's essential you get a priest to bless it first. It's only after the priest has blessed it, our Blessed Mother will. You know, she showed me the importance of priests once. I, I was in my local cathedral and I was there praying and our Blessed Mother was there, she'd appeared. And a priest came walking out of the sacristy and as he walked by, our lady dropped to her knees and bowed her head. That's the importance of priests. I'll never forget that. I hope you won't. Anyway, I'll uh, share the five luminous mysteries with you and then I'll tell you of a, a couple of the healings. In the first luminous mystery, the baptism in the Jordan, I saw a large chalice with blood flowing over the side to create a river of blood. Descending into the river of blood was a large host. Above the host, the dove of the Holy Spirit. Above the Holy Spirit, God the Father with his arms open wide, saying, come to the river of life. The next one, the wedding feast at Cana. In the centre of the host was a chalice with a drop of blood splashing over the side. Around it were the people at the wedding feast. And they were saying, you've saved the good wine until last. And by your goodness, we have this wine to offer. The next one, the coming of the kingdom. In the centre of the host, I saw Jesus with a crown on his head. He said, here is the kingdom. And the next one, in the centre of the transfiguration, in the centre of the host was the face of Jesus, shining so white, I could hardly look at it. And he said, be changed in me. And in the last one, Jesus was in a Catholic church at the altar, dressed in the purple robes of a priest. Around him were the apostles. In one hand he had the host, in the other the chalice. He said, this is my body, this is my blood, the new covenant. Now he said, give it to the sick, there'll be many healings, and I'll, I'll share a couple with you now. In uh, one city, there's a medical doctor who arranges talks for me, uh, Dr. Paul. And he'd arranged a talk, and on that same day, he had a young patient come in, a woman in her, who's 25, She'd just become completely blind. There's no cure for what she'd got. She came in, she broke down in front of him and said she was going to commit suicide. She didn't want to live anymore. She was so distressed. Now, she's a baptised Catholic, but she hadn't been to Mass since she was about 14. Didn't believe in God. Never prayed. Never went to church. Dr. Paul's here to look. Why did she come along to a talk tonight? I've arranged for a man called Alan Ames. Sometimes God heals people through him. Why did she just come along and try? In desperation, she agreed to come along. A friend brought her along. She experienced nothing through the talk, nothing through the healing prayers. On the way out, she got a Eucharistic rosary. Her friend got it. When they got home, the friend said, shall we pray this together? They prayed it. Experienced nothing. The blind woman went to bed. She put the beads and the pamphlet under her pillow. The next morning when she woke up, 
She could see normally. She couldn't believe it. She rushed back to Dr. Paul. He examined her, said it's a miracle. He sent her to the major eye hospital. They examined her. They couldn't believe it. They said, this is never cured. I said, what did you do? She said, well, I prayed the rosary. Well, they laughed at her, but they couldn't explain what happened. Now she goes to Mass every day and prays the rosary every day. And I thank God for that. There was a, another woman recently who was addicted to smoking things, not just cigarettes, but other things as well. She was a baptised Catholic, but again, she never went to Mass. She had a statue of Mary at home that her mother had given her, and a rosary bead she got, I think, from her mum. But she hadn't been to Mass for years. She went at Christmas, that was about it. And the only time she prayed a rosary was when she was in trouble, she might say a decade of rosary, maybe once a month or something. Anyway, she came along, experienced nothing through the talk or healing prayers, got the rosary and pamphlet on the way out. When she got home, she sat in front of the statue of Mary and began to pray the rosary. And she said that the statue it began to shine white. So she called her husband and children in and said, look at this. They came rushing in. They saw the statue shining white. They all dropped to their knees and began to pray the rosary together. And now they go to mass together every day as well or frequently. And the woman was completely healed of all her addictions. And I thank God for that. So give it to the sick. Give it to those who don't pray. Pray it with them if you can. If not, just leave it with them. Tell them it's from Jesus, blessed by Our Lady. See what happens by the grace of God. Now, last but not least, I'd like to share from my favourite book called Through the Eyes of Jesus. I'll just share a couple of minutes with you. Uh, this is uh, where Jesus showed me his life as he walked the Holy Land. Conversations between him and the apostles, events that happened. It's a book that will make you laugh and cry. Really is a book of conversion. We've had Muslims, Jews, Hindus, many, many young people converted reading this. Just recently in Perth, where I am, a, a Hindu woman told me someone gave her this book. She read it from cover to cover. She couldn't stop laughing and crying. She fell in love with Jesus. She gave it to her husband, a Hindu. Same thing happened to him. Now they're in the RCIA program. They become Catholics at Easter and in the cathedral every day for Mass. And they're just in love with Jesus. And thank God for that. When it was first published in English, it was given the imprimatur of an English-speaking bishop. About three years ago, it was published in Arabic. And the Latin patriarch of Jerusalem gave it his imprimatur, which is an extremely rare blessing. Anyway, I'd like to share this little bit with you. And this is Jesus. James turned to me as the song finished and asked, Lord, will you tell us more about heaven? There's complete silence as everyone looked at me expectantly. Heaven, I said, is where my father sits on his throne and where I will sit at his right hand when I return home. The only sound that could be heard as I paused was the crackling of the fire. I continued, Heaven is where eternal peace, eternal joy and eternal love reign supreme. Heaven is where all those who have lived their lives in the love of God and service to God, will find their eternal rewards. Heaven is where all are welcome and none are refused if they've lived as they should. Heaven is the most glorious reflection of God's love, for it's where that love resides. Heaven whose doors will be open to all by the key of sacrificial love that God offers to himself. My followers were listening intently to every word and now as I remained silent for a moment to let these words sink in, my followers looked at peace. Heaven, how can I compare it for you? Think of the greatest joy you've ever felt in your life, then think of that never-ending. Think of the greatest love you've ever felt in your life, then think of that never-ending. Think of the greatest celebration you've ever been to, then think of being there always. And still, you do not think of how great heaven is. Remember as a child how secure, how wanted, how happy you felt in your mother's and father's arms. How you never wanted that moment to end. Well, in heaven, it never does. Think of the times you were with true friends and how their company filled your heart with happiness. How you never wanted those times to end. In heaven, they never do. In heaven, you have family everywhere, friends everywhere and love everywhere. In heaven, God gives you all the goodness you could ever desire. And in heaven, God allows you to become part of all the goodness. 
Heaven, an eternal city of God's love, with no pain, no suffering, no hate, no anger, no jealousy, no greed, no sin, only love forever. Heaven awake, awaiting all who seek it in truth, and offered to all in love, I explained. James sitting next to me had his eyes closed and a smile on his face as he said, I feel as if I'm there now, Lord. I tell you, my friend, you're not far from heaven at this moment, I answered. Heaven, I can't wait. All that love, said John serenely. Think of it, joy for, forever, said Philip, and peace forever, joined Bartholomew. Heaven, I said, is what this life leads to if you believe and trust in God. <laughs>